It's a very difficult poem. Not so much to translate, but to give commentary to. گلی که خم به دادم پیچ و تابش زعاب دیدگونم دادم آبش به درگاه الهی که روابی گل از ما دیگری گیر گلابش When we used to gather and play music, I remember. Um, Hussein was not too happy with my singing. You know, the first few times he was okay, but he will call it rose. Rose means like. It has like the ceremonial quality to it that sometimes you hear it at funerals. And um, he would say, here we go again with Amir singing Rosa. I'm not quite sure which musician. Um, a few years ago, there was a musician, Terry Gross on NPR was interviewing him. And he was married to this woman. And uh, he left her for another woman. And while he was with this second woman, with this other person, he was diagnosed with cancer, stage three or four, I think. His new companion didn't really know what to do with, you know, this diagnosis. So this man, uh, quite famous, I just forget his name. He called his ex-wife and he said to her that, you know, I know you're, you had an experience with cancer because your father had it and you took care of him. I was diagnosed with cancer uh, stage three. Is it okay if I come back home so you can take care of me? And they had a relatively decent relationship, so he went back uh, for about a year and a half, two years, she took care of him. And when he got better, he went back to the woman he was with. And Terry Gross was a little puzzled. Uh, I think the show called Fresh Air. And he just said, you know, she just understood. And musicians are, you know, a little weird to begin with. But this was a little extreme, you know, as I was driving and just listening to the story. It's fascinating. And it's very much like what this poem is talking about. Um, in general, the poem speaks about, you know, someone works really, really hard at creating something, making something. But he never gets, or she, or the creator never gets a chance to see the fruits of his or her own labor, somebody else benefits from them. It's kind of like the you know fresh air story where here's a woman loves her ex-husband, whether it's because he's famous, whether it's because he has a lot of money, 
or maybe she just really likes him. She takes care of him, and perhaps somewhere deep down within her, she hopes that, you know, once he's better, she he will stay, and they kind of just will continue their marriage, but that wasn't the case. Um, after spending all of this time and energy on this man, you know, once he's healthy, he goes to the woman that he loves, the, you know, other person. So the first line is, Guli ke khum bedadum peach o tabish. Gul is flower. Peach o tab means basically design. So the first line, if you were to kind of Kind of give commentary to some of the key words here. You know, it takes a while for any seed to bear flowers. You plant them, you know, somewhere in the belly of the earth. And then you hope that it gets enough water, you hope that it gets enough light perhaps, you know, certain kinds of nourishment and so that, you know, the seed can kind of crack the skin and slowly come up to the surface. I mean, that's a, you know, tough place to be. You know, and miraculously, as you sit there looking at the ground, all of a sudden you see this tiny little green stem kind of coming out of the earth. And you're happy, you rejoice. And you give it some nourishment and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait for months, perhaps years. And all of a sudden you see, you know, this flower slowly budding. And so in the first line he's saying, you know, there is this flower that I created, I designed. But do you know how? Do you know how it was nourished? Ze'abe didegunum dadam abish. Plants need water. I didn't turn on the hose to give it water. It was my tears, you know. What nourished, you know, the seed, what the moisture that kind of quenched the thirst of the stem and through patience and through the tears of my eyes eventually you know this flower just blossomed And I suppose all of us, you know, sitting here, anyone um, who has ever created something beautiful, you could kind of symbolize it as, you know, as a, as a beautiful flower, you know, whether, you know, you work really, really hard in a relationship to beautify uh, your relationship with your companion, whether you sit in a cave, and you try to think thoughts 
We're trying to figure out the mysteries of life, who you are, what you are, if God exists, and eventually something comes about. If you're like Jackie, where you sit in the room and, you know, day after day, night after night, you practice cello, and there is something really, really, really beautiful that ultimately comes of it. Whether you're Karl Marx, where you get up at three in the morning and you go to the factories and you see all these little kids being exploited by an uncaring, cruel, unjust system, and then you come back home and you write down notes about what you witnessed, you know. Whether, you know, like, you know, you guys, you sit home, you read books, you take notes, you make your notes into a lecture, you go into the classroom, and you present this beautiful, you know, sermon to your students. Um, whether you perfect your language and you make it really clear and articulate and you hope that it reaches the ears of people, the point is that flower symbolizes anything that anyone does that is beautiful, you know. It's not a thorn, it's a flower. And the thing about flower is that <clears throat> they all need an open space and, you know, they don't really care who looks upon them and they don't hold their fragrance to a, you know, special group of people. It's just there for everyone to kind of enjoy. So that's the nature of a flower. It takes a long, 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 long time for it to be created, you know. Uh, you know, consider people like Jesus Christ. As a human being, they're really like flowers. They're beautiful. Their fragrance kind of spread out. Um, I mean, this guy just preached, supposedly, as far as the New Testament is concerned, you know, for only three years. I mean, he's lived on for about 2,000 years. You know, you have Gilgamesh, who was a thorn as a human being, but, you know, the gods favored him. He loved, he lost, he grieved, he became lonely, he was in despair. He had to go through many trials and tribulations and eventually became, you know, a flower of a human being. So, But if you really want to know the sort of flower that Babata is talking about, it's kind of defined in the second line, you know. I have plants in the backyard and front yard. I just turn on the hose, you know. I put some water in a pitcher, uh, in a bucket, and just go, you know, give them some water. But the water he's talking about here is tears, it's weeping. You know, you know, for kids, you know, crying comes very, very easily and naturally. Um, it doesn't take much. You give them a mean look, they cry. Uh, you yank a toy out of their hand, they cry. They want ice cream and you say no, they cry. It just doesn't matter, you know, but when you become a young adult, um, because of this component inside us called pride, you know, you try to be very, very self-contained. Uh, you don't want to shame or embarrass yourself. You want to kind of prove yourself to be tough and all together. So crying comes very, 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 very difficult for us adults. Uh, You know, in the first line, Babatar says there is this flower that I designed. So, you know, you have a man who has a certain idea about himself, about life, about how he should be, how he should express all the things that live inside him. 
He is the creator of whatever flower that he has created. Now, if you happen to be a creator of a piece of art, and I don't mean painting or sculpting, it could be any kind of art, but you have to be the creator. And what he's saying is that when you are a creator, um, and since Babatar is a, to some extent a religious spiritual man, I'm guessing that the flower he's talking about has some spiritual qualities to it. Now, the problem with the world of spirituality is that it contains a lot of yearning and longing. There's a good amount of separation. And in separation, there is fear, there is anxiety, there is frustration, there is despair, there is loneliness, there is anguish, there is dread. Thoughts of suicide, meaninglessness, isolation. It's just such a bad place to be for any human being. You know, you know they, they have... Some of these people argue that Rumi didn't really enjoy sadness. He was always happy. I don't think that's true. I don't think... Uh, I think if you happen to be aware and mindful of the fact that there are lots of people out there who have miserable lives and who struggle to survive, you know, you may write, you know, happy things in, in poetry or poem form, but the truth is the undercurrent uh, has a good amount of sorrow and sadness in it. If you are the creator of this flower, it means that there has to be a good amount of psychic tension inside you. Union, separation, longing, yearning. And it's not just pain you know, uh, it's a pain that to some extent lives in your soul and it hits a nerve to the point where the pain morphs itself into sorrow. And when you are sorrowful, tears begin to roll down your cheeks. And in every single drop, there's an ocean of sorrow in it. It contains a good amount of sadness. It contains a good amount of awareness that you are kind of to some extent homesick, you know. Uh, as Hafiz would say, ما بدين جا نره هشمت و جا آمد ایم از بده حادث این جا به پناه آمد ایم But this is really not a place I wanted to be. This was never my choice. It seems like accidentally I was kind of just thrown down here. And what else can I do, really? You know, bad hadasa, you know, it's just a tragedy. You know, all human beings have been kind of dumped down here without much guidance, without much tools to kind of figure out who they are, what they are, what they ought to do with the short few hours of their existence. And so all human condition really is one of tragedy. And there is nothing funny or humorous about it unless you want to make it into a satire. You know, whatever flower Babatar is talking about, what he's saying is that, you know, you see this flower here, but what you don't see is it has gotten water through my tears and I have tears because of sorrow and I have sorrow because of separation and I have separation because I am homesick you know uh, you know if I was to kind of make this in a very simple way imagine if you can kind of stretch your memories back to when you were a student and your instructor told you, you can write an essay on anything that you're passionate about, you know. And so you wrote about your parents, or you wrote about your boyfriend, or you wrote about a pet that you kind of lost, or some event that just moved you, and you kind of pour your passion. I mean, you create this flower, and you write it, and you hand it to your instructor. And then your instructor, you know, you, 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 he gives back your essay. And there are red markings everywhere, you know. 
And you kind of sit back and you say, you know, I poured my soul in this essay. I don't think this person understood what he was reading, you know. And so, and that's what the you know, third and the fourth lines are all about, that is it really fair, is it really just that I create the flower, but somebody else takes the nectar, you know, the very marrow of this flower, the very juice that kind of makes this flower a flower with all the beautiful fragrance, you know. How is it that this is something that I, you know, create, but someone else benefits from it? And I suppose it's, I mean, you can take this in so many different areas, Cassie. I, I don't really know where to start. If you consider Jesus Christ to be a flower and he gave birth to his emotions, you know, he was the one in the desert for three years or 18 years, you know, he was the one who had to wrestle with Satan. He, has, he was the one who had to kind of walk away from his mom, from his dad, from his community because of all the conflict and misery that lived inside him. So he goes for 18 years, he comes back, and he has a flower, he has a message. He, you know, it's a good news, it's a gospel, and it's, it's something that can inspire people, that can change them, transform them. Sure, it comes with difficulties, you know, you may have to kind of examine why you want to get married, you have to examine why you are married, you have to examine why you want to have children, you want to examine why you have to do anything for Caesar, for the, you know, the world. I mean, it's a difficult thing, but it's a price worth paying, you know. So what happens? What happens to this flower? It gets caged. You know, they create an institution. You know, it becomes a Catholic church. It becomes a Franciscan, it becomes a Jesuit, it becomes Mormon. So you have this beautiful flower. Everything was created by the very hands of Jesus Christ. What happens then? He begins to be exploited. It's a flower in the hands of other people that slowly withers. It's a flower that exists only in name. There is no reality to this flower anymore, you know. You know, if you want to make this a bit more secular, it's you have to go back to someone like Karl Marx, you know. I mean, you wake up at six in the morning and you go to Starbucks and you're really, really good at making various kinds of coffees, you know. You make the best lattes, you make the best mochas, you make the best Americana. And your store is really, really busy because of you. Once in a while you say, I want to taste my own creation. I want to, you know, get a sip of coffee myself. But you're there to serve other people. And then you see how they drink your work of art. They put too much sugar, or they don't put sugar. They put too much milk, or they don't put milk. They throw most of it out, you know. And you see their facial expression as they kind of drink your work of art and it disgusts you. They have no idea how many years it took you to become, you know, really proficient, good, creative at what you do. Um, imagine, I mean, you know, all of you will eventually have children. Some of you do have children. Some of you raise other people's children. I mean, the amount of work, I mean, you have to understand, you guys, I mean, the, the four or five of us sitting here. You know, parents raise their kids with the tears of their eyes. They really, really do. The amount of grief, the amount of sorrow, the amount of effort. They don't do a great job. I mean, everybody does according to their own capacity. You know, whoever, whatever your parents are and whatever they have done, they really have give it, given it 110%. And they do it with their soul and heart despite being completely exhausted. So what happens? 
one day you come home after school and they smell profanity in your language and they sit back and they say really after all of my hard work the world takes my son takes my daughter destroys all the flower that lives inside them and instead gives them to me with a good amount of trash within how is that possible you know you're all in the classroom because you have a passion for philosophy for religion maybe all of you here are seekers after truth you know and sometimes you can't sleep because of your quest you know it's a heart-wrenching heartbreaking path and so you know you write down all the things that you're feeling and thinking and you take your lecture to the class classroom and all of a sudden all of your passion gets snatched not by the people outside you begin to become worried about your self-image your pride gets in the way then you say to yourself, well, I don't really want to embarrass myself in front of my students, so what do you do? You begin to modify your lecture. You destroy, you take out all the spirit that lives inside your notes, you know, and it just becomes law, it becomes a mathematical equation, you know. I remember uh, when I went to this concert, it was the first time Shajarian had come to America, the government opened its gates and musicians were now free to leave the country for a few months at a time to give concerts to the Persians who live, you know, outside of Iran. And I remember Shajarian came to uh, San Francisco and it was, you know, two hours of absolutely amazing performance. Near the end, something really strange happened. Um, Shah Jaryan did not have a tendency of keeping his eyes closed while singing. Oftentimes, you know, it was open. And near the end of the concert, he looked at his watch. He saw what time it was. And it was, the watch was on the on the floor and then he picks it up and puts it around his wrist and then a couple of minutes later the performance ended you know you could say because he's so he's a master of what he does he's extremely proficient he knows when to start and he knows when to stop 